NFL Network proudly presents America's Game, a countdown of the 20 greatest Super Bowl champions. And now, number 18. By 1969, a grandstand seat in Municipal Stadium was the hot ticket in Kansas City. The Chiefs were arguably the most talented team in the American Football League and may also have been the most accessible. We had guys on the team who would go over and chat with the people. They weren't more than five, ten yards away from us. And I could definitely hear what they had to say once I got to the sidelines, but it was an intimate group. When you're in Kansas City, you see the fact that this is a Midwestern city, a Midwestern culture, and an opportunity for people who have those kind of values enjoying professional football. It didn't appear to be just a commercial enterprise, but it had that same kind of excitement that you would have had in college as well as high school. The banners were a part of it. The chief ads were a part of it. Well, the Chiefettes, my daughter was one of the first Chiefettes, so yeah, I watched it to see how she was doing. Dawson, a quarterback, gets the snap, he fakes the run to Mike Garrett, plenty back, goes to the ball, and out by it. Our team in Kansas City, we aren't really just Kansas City's team, we're the, we call our team Mid-America's team. We represent Kansas, Missouri, the western half of Missouri, Oklahoma, Arkansas, Iowa, and Nebraska. And this is a pretty broad area, and we have an area of interest there. And this always amazed me about fans. Businessmen would go out and sell season tickets. And if you sold, I think, 100 season tickets, then you would receive a red jacket. You would be in that the Red Coat Club. And you would line up on the field as the players were introduced. The game day atmosphere offered the flavor of small town America. But Kansas City's football team was big league in every way. In his 13th season, veteran quarterback Len Dawson guided a balanced attack that was as imaginative as it was overpowering. The offense featured huge pass targets, including number 89, Otis Taylor, the tallest and strongest wide receiver in the league. Size was also a hallmark on defense. The pro game had never seen a bigger or faster defensive unit than the Chiefs. The talent was there. Super Bowl rings were not. In seasons past, the Chiefs had come close, but could not win a world championship. In 1966, a painful second half collapse doomed Kansas City against the NFL's Green Bay Packers. Vince Lombardi's post-game comments may have stung even worse. I think the Kansas City team is a real top football team. It doesn't compare with the National Football League teams. That's what you want me to say, I said it. <laughs> well, that irritated us. And that, that, that stuck with us until we had another opportunity to get back to a Super Bowl. We know that that was a motivating factor for us to get a little better so that we can compete against the best. A return visit to the Super Bowl required knocking off the Oakland Raiders first. But over the next two seasons, the Chiefs were brushed aside by their rivals. Oakland was the arch enemy. We were in the same division, and we were the two best teams, we felt, in the league. 
it was a rivalry that I was introduced to when I first came with the Chiefs. You get indoctrinated right away, you get brainwashed right away, and uh, uh, I can't root for the Raiders today. <laughs> There was a stretch where the Kansas City Chiefs played the Oakland Raiders and it lost seven out of eight games, which was bitter, bitter frustration. The worst of those defeats came during the 1968 playoffs, the most lopsided loss in franchise history. In 68, to lose that game as we did, it really inspired us that we had to really improve our game overall, that when we got back again, to that kind of situation against Oakland. We would not have that same occurrence. So it was one of really giving impetus to the 1969 season. Hank Stram was not fearful of trying something different. And he was the guy in charge. Never any doubt about that, who was running the football team. That's Hank Stram. All right, this is our playbook, and it's divided into three chapters. But you got to understand, back in the, in the 50s and 60s, everybody was a copycat. Well, Hank says, wait a minute. Why do we have to do the same thing all the time? No, I, I, I don't want to do that. From the unique semicircular huddle to dizzying pre-snap choreography, Hank Stram's innovative schemes were designed to confuse and frustrate his opponents. Stram's basic strategy was if you can get a football player on the football field and have him not know for sure what he's supposed to be doing, then you have a very big advantage. I think that was the basis of his coaching. Hank has always been a guy that wanted to look at new ideas. The restaurateurs in the Kansas City area, as soon as he would come in, would run over with, with uh, paper napkins to put down instead of the cloth ones that he would use because they were more expensive. Because he would just get to doodling, thinking up things, and it was constantly doing. Football was his life. The stack defense and how we were able to utilize different formations, keeping the same 11 players on the field, were all innovations from Hank. But Hank also had the approach to the way he dressed on the sideline. When he walked out of his home, he was going to be viewed satirically proper. He made sure that he was always exquisitely dressed. They always used to laugh because uh, guys that would have seen his closet at his home, it was like you're in a dry cleaners because he would have coats with certain shirts with certain pants and all that sort of thing. He had a custom tail in Kansas City. I remember the name was Verrill's Tailors, and Verrill would custom tailor the jackets and slacks for everybody on the team, including coaches, each season. He had a dress code, and you had to have shirt and tie, and you had to wear the black jacket that was a part of the wardrobe, as well as hound's tooth slacks. Stram could also tailor his remarks with a needle when the team did not look its best. He dropped the ball. Jesus, he dropped the ball. Oh, like he tried to catch that ball with his elbows. You got cleats on your shoes? No. What? Your full step. Geez, you look like you got bedroom slippers on. They're making that turn like they got ice skates on. But he knew how to handle each and every individual on the team. And, you know, he handled me differently than he would handle, say, a, a defensive lineman or a linebacker. Uh, how about a 30, uh, 41, 41 uh, screen? When he said land, then uh, he was in a pretty good mood. And things probably were going pretty well. And so it was Len or Lenny. This guy is so loose over here, Lenny, you can throw there any time you want. You threw one. But when he said Leonard, now, he, now that's serious. That's like my parents used to do. They used to go, Leonard. What are you doing in the huddle, Leonard? My God, what are you doing in that huddle all that, all that time? We're just missing it that much every time. Every single time. We're that close. You got to speed it up. Well, geez, tell them to shut their big mouth and call them. Dawson started the 1969 season with a pair of touchdown passes on opening day, despite playing with a bruised hand. But Len suffered a far more serious injury a week later in a 31-0 win at Boston. Somebody rolled up into my leg, and I knew at the time that something happened. And I went to the bench to the doctor to have him examine my knee. They didn't have MRIs in those days, so they couldn't really tell what the problem was. And so he took some x-rays of it, and he 
came back and he would say, oh my goodness, my goodness. I said, what is it? And he said, well, he said, uh, I think that you got some damage to your ligaments and there could be a tear in there. We found out the seriousness of Lenny's injury a couple of days after the game. There was, at, at least in my mind, there was no doubt that he was gonna be operated on. Henry was looking for a physician that may have a different opinion. And so he had found Dr. at St. Louis, Dr. Reynolds, who was the orthopedic surgeon for the then St. Louis football Cardinals. He had a different theory about these type of injuries. And he said, my theory is this, do not put any weight on it for at least two weeks. And every day do some leg lifts so your leg does not atrophy. Then we'll see what it's like after a couple of weeks because it may be just a strain and not a tear. And so Henry says, well, there you are, Leonard. <laughs> Gave you that option, didn't I? <laughs> it's up to you now. I said, the team does need you, but it's up to you now. I said, well. But I remember Lenny saying that all he needed was one guy to tell him that he didn't have to have it done and he wasn't gonna go looking anymore, and that's what he did. Because I think there was a real expectation of this team doing really good things. And I think Lenny, I don't know how old he was at the time, but he wasn't a young man as far as being an NFL player was concerned. I just don't think he wanted to miss the ride on the carousel. The Cincinnati game after I got hurt was the first one that I had missed in my years of football. And so Jackie Lee was getting the start and Jackie Lee had played before, he was a veteran. Cincinnati was, you know, a young team that was an expansion team. And Jackie got hurt, he broke his ankle in that ball game, so Jackie Lee is out for the year and we happened to lose that game as well. It was a game that was kind of a shocker for us. Your starting quarterback didn't even suit up. Your, your backup quarterback got hurt, and that's when Mike Livingston came in. Now you've got a rookie quarterback. But the reality was that we had to go week to week and continue to win because you couldn't lose a few games and maybe find yourself out of contention. So we had to do a lot more to give the whole team a chance to succeed. Over the next two months, the Chiefs would find other ways to win during Dawson's absence. Bobby Bell with a touchdown. Injuries had forced the Chiefs to turn to third string quarterback Mike Livingston. Mike, is it particularly difficult for you mentally to get ready for this ball game in your situation? Well, it's, it's not too difficult uh, mentally. It's a tremendous challenge, and uh, it's a great opportunity for me, and uh, I just hope I can make the best of it. I remember Hank Stram at that time saying, look, it doesn't make any difference who the quarterback is. It's just like driving a Cadillac. It's still a Cadillac. You get in there, you're going to have somebody drive it, and everything's going to work out all right. And you know what? We believe that. Mike Livingston was a rookie from SMU. He wasn't the greatest picture passer in the world. He wasn't the greatest runner in the world. He had an awful lot on his plate to assimilate, but he was good enough. Whatever the situation took, he was good enough to get the job done, and that's what happened. When you start measuring how well a quarterback has done, is he a winner or is he not a winner? And with Mike Livingston being the starting quarterback, the third string starting quarterback and a rookie. He won five straight football games, and that's a great, great success story. Livingston didn't have to do it all by himself. The backs and receivers were there to lend a helping hand. And he's still running. Now he's just The Chiefs won every game during Dawson's recuperation thanks to their punishing defense. And I'm telling you, that team, and particularly the defense, they took over. The other teams scored very few points. The defense scored, I think, about as many points as the offense scored. He's back to throw, rush is put on. He does run, it's intercepted by Kearney. He's the 40, to midfield, at the 40, at the 30. Touchdown for Jim Kearney, a 60-yarder. Isn't that beautiful? I was hurt, but that defensive unit, the starting defensive unit, started every game that year. And how often does that happen? But there was more than good health that made the Chiefs' defense unique. When we fielded our starting team, 
my uh, second year with the Chiefs, and I started at outside linebacker. I was one of three white guys that played, and we started with eight blacks. Uh, you got to remember the times. That was not the norm by any stretch. But I think Hank Stram, to his undying credit, looked at the great minds of great football talent that was in a lot of these black schools, especially in the South. We don't particularly care what color he is, what nationality, what anything. The only concern we have is uh, bringing them in with the idea of competing for our squad. And if they earned a right to be a member of our 40-man squad, then they're going to be here. Kansas City's unsung scouting hero was Lloyd Wells, a former news photographer with a pipeline to African-American colleges. Lloyd Wells was a scout for the Chiefs who had the opportunity to mine the historically black colleges of America and to let the teams know where there was talent, where in the past that talent had been somewhat overlooked or had not been desired to be as uh, strongly recruited. And I must do one thing. This guy is a scout for us, and he does a great job. Lloyd Wells, well. well. he scouted and brought in so many of these outstanding stars for the Chiefs. Uh, Very happy. Great day for all of us. Wells' best find may have been Morgan State's Willie Lanier, taken in the 67 draft with Jim Lynch of Notre Dame. We were both drafted in the second round. We were both drafted as middle linebackers. Well, I think any time you have a competition like the the kind that Jim can provide, that we, either one of us who wins a position for the middle linebacker job, we would be able to represent the team as uh, the Chiefs would like to be represented. It never really occurred to me that there'd never been a black middle linebacker before. Obviously, Willie Lanier wanted to be the first black middle linebacker in the NFL. And quite frankly, he deserved the position, no question. He was a very, very good football player, which obviously has proven out in that he's in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. We were absolutely competing for the same job, but it never got to be a personal thing between us. On the double zone, how you want to handle it offset? On the uh, double zone. You can move over. I'll move over. You take first, and I take. Yeah, well, I got that feedback. Yeah, yeah, all right, all right. You gotta move. Lynch, number 51, found a home on the outside, a switch that made the Chiefs' linebacking core the best in pro football. I think Willie was very beneficial to me and very helpful to me. And we got to the point where we got to be very good friends in the, the last eight years we roomed together. We chased that song. We chased him into the end zone how many times? Huh? But the lack of bias was one that was extremely impressive because the relationships were pure. And it wasn't something that was really pushed. But I think the individuals understood that if there was going to be accomplishment at the highest level, that everyone had to understand each other's differences and each other's similarities. And that was the way it happened to have come together and had become a great history of the success that the franchise was able to have. The comradeship, uh, the black-white relationships that we have are, are I don't think, parallel in, in, in any team. And I, I'm just elated with it. And, and these kind of things build champions and, and keep you champions. And I feel real good about the Chiefs' future. Avoiding knee surgery had been the right choice for Len Dawson. After a month's recovery, Dawson was almost ready to play. But while sidelined, Len kept busy with his other day job. There were only three television stations here in Kansas City, and one of them was looking for a sportscaster. I was working for an insurance company at the time, so I took a leave of absence. Uh, that's been 40 years ago that a leave of absence has been a long one. Frank, you had a great year last year. What are your goals for this year? I had uh, a radio station, too. I had four radio shows a day. They were about three minutes in length, Monday through Fridays. And I was anchoring sports on the ABC affiliate here in Kansas City on the 6 o'clock and the 10 o'clock news. We'd get through practices 5.30. I'd rush through the shower and get downtown, and I was on the 6 o'clock news. And uh, defensively, as far as the Chiefs are concerned, we have some new faces out there that we have to take a look at. Most pro quarterbacks spent their evenings watching game film. Len Dawson was on film, weeknights at 6 and 10. He certainly was not uh, a uh, 
reporter that was going to get the dirty news or anything like that. It was a pretty sanitized thing. But, you know, at that time, all the media was pretty sanitized as far as the Chiefs were concerned. I'm going to badmouth the offensive line? I don't think so. <laughs> because they could say, Lenny, let's see what you can do with no blocking out there. It was funny, too, because I did all the interviews. Nolan, you're not a giant among giants out here. Is this uh, the first time that you've played against guys as big as you've seen here in camp today? I'd have to tell them what I was going to ask them. Uh, I already knew the answer. Oftentimes, I had to give them the answer. <laughs> but you're out there at a flanker. How much opportunity did you get to play in, in college as a flanker? Well, none until my senior year. And uh, after a uh, flanker graduated, well, I had to move into flanker, and I was my team leading score from this flanker position. On November 9th, Dawson was in front of the cameras again, this time at starting quarterback. Len settled for a supporting role as his backfield mates pushed the team's record to 8-1. Next up was a showdown with the world champion Jets, but that game would be overshadowed by tragedy. Well, we're getting ready to go to New York on Saturday, and Friday evening I got a call from my brother in Alliance, Ohio, that my father had passed away from a sudden heart attack. You know, you lose your father, you know, you're losing somebody very special. And the guys were very supportive, and they kind of left me alone. And it really was not expected. And Lenny wound up playing the game. The question mark that you always have is whether something such as that would take away from performance. But when you see performance that is at its same level or even higher, uh, you just appreciate it because I think the human part is that you wonder how well you would have done in that same kind of circumstance. Back to throw, Len Dawson. Dawson wide open, Taylor's there, touchdown! Nobody's even close to Taylor. You really do realize what an effort it took for Lenny Dawson to do that. Lenny Dawson is an extraordinary person, and I'd watched him do extraordinary things. We wound up winning the football game, and he took care of his business, no question, and left right from New York and went back to Alliance, Ohio for the funeral. A week later, the 9-1 Chiefs hosted the Raiders in a Western Division showdown. But a still grieving Dawson was not at his best, and the Raiders won. I think I had a bad game. I think I threw several interceptions in that ball game that was a difference. And it wasn't because they overpowered us or did something. It was because of my mental mistakes. Matters worsened the following week when Dawson re-injured his knee in a win over Denver. From a precautionary standpoint, uh, it was best for me to come out of that game. My whole thought was to be ready for the championship run, for the playoff run. And I think that was Hank Stram's feeling as well, that he didn't want to take any chances at that point. So I came out of that ball game and did not play the following game. The last game of the season was against the Raiders. And both of us were in the playoffs. Whoever won would have home field advantage. Surprisingly, Hank Stram put his normally innovative offense into hibernation as the Chiefs ran on virtually every play. I only threw the ball six or eight times, something like that. Basically a running game, just grinding it. And that was about as close as you came to criticizing Stram's strategy that I can recall that year. We just had to have more production point-wise, and not throwing the football was pretty, pretty hard to swallow. We didn't win that ball game. We lost it and had to go to New York and take on the Jets. Hank decided he was more concerned about the health of his football team, and in particular, Hank me, the quarterback. The Kansas City Chiefs had already been to the Super Bowl. They didn't want to get to the Super Bowl. They wanted to win the Super Bowl. So now we're in a situation where we've got to take the hardest road we can possibly get to winning the Super Bowl. We had to go to Shea Stadium, and we had to beat the Oakland Raiders. It was not a bunch of happy football players coming back from that game. What a day that was in New York. Playing a New York Jet team that won the Super Bowl the year before, they were a good football team. The weather was awful because the wind was really blowing. 
the wind would come through and it wouldn't be going one way, it would be swirling. I used to warm up with Fred Arbanis, our tight end, and Freddie had lost the sight in one eye and we used to loosen up. I'm playing catch with Fred and throwing it easy and that wind would get it and it's banging all over. He said, I only got one eye. He said, get one of these defensive linemen over here, play catch with you. I can't afford to lose the other one. Playing catch with Arbanis came much easier after kickoff. A critical gain by the Kansas City tight end set up a field goal that gave the Chiefs a 6-3 fourth quarter lead. It was late in the ball game. Joe Namath had thrown the pass into the end zone. It was incomplete, but the flag goes down. Interference, Kansas City, first and goal on the one-yard line. That 36 inches were going to be our season, our future. So as I'm heading down the field to call the defense, I'm noticing heads are starting to be bowed, concessions are starting to be accepted, that they felt we were going to lose. And my reality was that that was not a concession we could make. As a running play to Matt Snell behind right guard, the head of the goal line like Lanier and Gary Mays. So on second down, they tried to run a play also into the line of scrimmage. Running play coming off the map at the top of the goal line. Lanier is it. And again, the Jets did not make it. It's third down and one. So then on third down, what Namath did was to try to run a play action. But Bobby Bell uh, didn't take the fake into the line of scrimmage, was able to get position to take away the pass on the outside. What pressure put on by Bobby Bell? Bobby Bell made the Jets quarterback commit himself. And so they kicked the field goal and tied the score. Now a field goal wins it. I had a guy on the sidelines named Otis Taylor. While that defense was holding the Jets on the one yard line, Otis Taylor is talking to me on the sidelines, drawing in the dirt a play that he thought could work. We're going on the field, and Otis says to me, he says, uh, are you gonna call that play? I said, no, not now. I'll wait until I get in the huddle so I can tell the rest of the guys, hell yes, I'm gonna call that play. running on the free safety. So I threw it and I really got a great release. So good I thought, ah, oh, damn, I overthrew him. But I forgot about the other speed that Otis Taylor had. He put it into another gear. Fought his way down inside the 10 yard line. And on the next play, I hit Gloucester Richardson. Money takes the snap, he fakes the run, but he'll be back to throw. He does run deeper. We knew this was just the one game we had to win to get to where we wanted to go, and that is to Oakland, California, and play the Oakland Raiders. And we knew that was not going to be easy. They'd beaten us twice already in that season. There was a certain confidence. We felt like we were a team of destiny, that this was the time that we were going to beat them. We were in their backyard, and we were going to smack them in the face, and we were going to win. Back to throw, Lanier is going to throw it back. Did he get free by Aaron Brown? The defense sacked Oakland four times and grabbed just as many interceptions. He is throwing one deep for Warren Wells. The center is up for 20 by Emmett Thomas. Back to the 30, to the 40. He may break it. He's at midfield. He's at the 40. After three years of greater dominance, this day belonged to the Chiefs' swarming defense and playmaking receiver Otis Taylor. We were backed up on our goal line. It was third and long. If we have to punt, the ball out of our end zone. They're going to get great field position. And I'd called a play where Otis Taylor was just running a fly pattern up the sidelines toward our sideline. He's back in the end zone, eight yards. Dawson throws a wobbler intended for Taylor. And Otis makes a remarkable catch. Great grab by Taylor. And to be able to have Lenny throw a ball along the sideline as far as it had to be thrown. And for Taylor, I believe his positions of where he was, he had to catch it with his left hand to be able to position that ball to come in and get both feet in bounds, which I think some of them want to argue whether he was in bounds or not, but of course he was. And 
There is some doubt whether his feet were in bounds or not. I'm not sure about that, but I guess we'll go by the official record. Anyway, he caught a pass right in front of our bench, and after that play, it started, things started really going our way. Back to throw, Lenny Dawson. He has time to throw. He's firing one deep, wide open, Frank Pitt. He makes the catch. He has run out of bounds at the one-yard line. Lenny Dawson gives it a running play to Bobby Holmes. He turns the corner. He scores! And when we played the Oakland Raiders in the final game between two American Football League teams and won that game to get us to the Super Bowl, it was a milestone. How many people, I wonder, really thought the American Football League would succeed? In just one week, the AFL champions would be granted a final opportunity to prove their league was the equal of the established NFL. New Orleans, next up, we're the champions, baby! After arriving in New Orleans just five days before Super Bowl IV, Len Dawson's world was once again turned upside down. A number of famous names in pro football will be asked to talk to a federal grand jury in Detroit and to tell whatever they know about gambling on sports. The pro football players asked to testify to the grand jury include Len Dawson of the Kansas City Chiefs. A federal grand jury will begin hearing testimony in two weeks, January 20th, about the operations of perhaps the largest betting gambling operation in sports history. Federal officials here have been... That hits the national news. You're getting ready for a Super Bowl game and says, my God, what the heck's going on here? Hank Stram and some other people getting together, trying to determine how to deal with the media. And finally I said, why don't, why don't we tell them the truth? <laughs> But, you know, it, turned, it was kind of weird. I mean, the, the, the gambler's name was Dawson. There was a person in Detroit by the name of Donald Dawson who had uh, attempted to either call Lenny or call other players in the league. Though not related to Donald Dawson, Len had met him a decade earlier while playing in Pittsburgh. I said, I do know this person. I said, he did call me when I injured my knee, and he called me when my dad passed away to offer his condolences. That's the only thing that I've heard from this guy in years and years, and I really didn't know him that well before. We made the announcement to the media at an evening press conference, and that was basically going to be it. But Hank Stram said, this is it. This is the last time we're going to talk about this thing, because we're here to get ready for a football game. Lenny is very quiet. Uh, he, he doesn't express a great deal of animation outwardly. It's very hard to, to, to tell how much it affected him. I know he was uh, deeply hurt inside because he's a great young man. The thing that's so difficult is that, uh, you know, had nothing to do with this. It not only affected me, but it really affected my family to the point where my son, who was really looking forward to the game, tells his mother he doesn't want to go. You know, she has to talk him into coming because I wanted him to be there. You come to know your teammates, what their character is, how they conduct themselves, and all of that. So with that being the case, you felt very good about the fact that that didn't fit Lenny's style. That did not fit how he approached his life. But you also wondered about the coincidences of time, that here it is a week before the Super Bowl, if there's someone who has an investigation going, what caused it to surface at that moment in time versus some other moment in time? We of Missouri have admiration for Len Dawson, the able and courageous quarterback of the Kansas City Chiefs. It is most unfortunate that any such story about one of the nation's great athletes should be leaked to the news media just prior to the most important professional football game of the season. People uh, offering their prayers and backing him 100%. By Friday, he pepped up a little, but I'll be frank with you, for a couple of days, he was, uh, looked like he aged about five years to me, and uh, for a while, I kept trying to get him up. He stayed in the room 90% uh, of the time and only left for interviews. Must have been a nerve-shattering experience for you after the gambling story broke. Well, there's no doubt about it. I figured if I handle that junk, that I can handle about anything else, because that was really unfair. A lot of our teammates. Not only did I have to face the media, say that I'm innocent, I had to address my teammates as well, because they're sitting there, they're concerned about it, and I, had, I told them it's a bunch of BS. There's no truth to the damn stuff. Hank came in uh, then and, and said, well, has anybody got any questions uh, whatsoever? And then E.J. Holub, and only E.J. could say it, you know, put it in perspective. Well, E.J. was always pulling something. Oh, 
he was a real holler guy, always very enthusiastic. Holla just says, well, uh, when do we eat and uh, when do I get my tickets? And that broke the tension. All of a sudden, we're back to focusing on what we're there for. The first ever Super Bowl held in New Orleans featured pageantry and spectacle that literally went over the top. I'd see this Viking going along, and he was jumping in and out of this uh, hot air balloon. And then I understood that the uh, hot air balloon was supposed to be going up. It was kind of a mass confusion on the field. The uh, hot air balloon didn't have enough hot air in it or lost its hot air or something. The Vikings gondola started to bounce along in towards some of the seating at the part of the end zone. It was just kind of interesting to see a planned activity that where the people didn't quite know how to control that gondola as well as that hot air balloon, which maybe that was a, a coincidence that things were not going to go well for the Vikings that day. The football experts disagreed, tabbing the AFL's Chiefs as 13-point underdogs. I think it's just that, oh, that's the American Football League. Last year when the Jets won, beat Baltimore, that was a fluke. We were the stupid stepchild of professional football, but not ready for prime time players. We resented that. So that was a motivating factor to us, because we didn't know too much about the Minnesota Vikings. And uh, fortunately, they didn't know too much about us. We've got a myriad of formations. We've got formations that you start out in one thing, you're completely different before the ball snap. You'll go through three separate formations in one series. And if you're not watching that every day, it gets extremely confusing. And they've got one week to figure out the tendencies of the Kansas City Chiefs, which is a virtual impossibility. But the running backs, if we put things together, we'll kill these guys. When there was a timeout, I'd go to the sidelines. Yes, and I'd go to Hank, because Hank was the quarterback coach, the offensive coordinator. Instead of Henry asking me what I'm thinking about, he said, Lenny, you got to do this. You got to throw that hitch pass out here more often. You got to throw it out there. You got to do this. You got to do that. Throw that thing on the outside, Leonard. That double wing, far, you, do it more often. You're throwing it one. You can't, you can't cover that thing, Lenny. Throw it any time. That hitch on the outside. That, that's a good time to throw it right there, you see? Well, I did not realize that Henry had been microphoned in the Super Bowl because he had mentioned it to any of us. I wouldn't have been surprised if it was Hank's idea, <laughs> to be honest with you. But virtually everything that he said, he's said many, many times before. It's certainly entertainment. How in the world can all six of you miss a play like that? All six of you miss a play. Come on, Lenny. Pump it in there, baby. Just keep matriculating the ball down the field, boys. You're going to matriculate the ball down the field. Uh, where he comes up with these things, I don't know. But he's a classic. He's a showman. It was there, wasn't it, boys? It was, it was there, wasn't it? <laughs> and knowing Hank, who enjoyed wordsmithing, that someone in the midst of the most important game of their life could still maintain the kind of presence to offer a view of what a coach goes through, all of that was Stram. He was able to talk about eloquently how they did it and then how poorly the other guys attempted to do things against his team. They didn't know where Mike was. No, he couldn't find him. Didn't know where he was. They didn't know where to go. Yeah, Kosulke was running around there like it was a Chinese fire drill. They looked like they're flat as hell. Stram added to Minnesota's confusion with a surprise play call that yielded maximum results. Gloucester, tell him 65 toss power trap. Get in there for 65 toss power trap. Here comes Gloucester Richardson into the game with a play. He said, Hank, Hank, why don't you run 65 toss power trap? I said, we'll, we'll run that play in a long time. You sure that's what he wants? Yeah, yeah, that's 65 toss power trap. 65 toss power trap. That might pop wide open, Rats. Running play coming to Garrett on a trap. Touchdown. Garrett scores with a ball. Was it there, boys? Was that there, Rats? Oh, oh, nice go, going, baby. <laughs> yeah! The mentor. 65 toss power trap. Yeah! <laughs> yeah! I told you that maybe the there. Yes, sir, boys. <laughs> Woo! We're leading now 16 to nothing, and they got to overcome that against our defense. No way. 
Put your hand over your heart and you can feel it pound out. What a moment for all of the Kansas City Chiefs. They're beating the best that the NFL has to offer out here today. In the last game ever played between the AFL and NFL, the exclamation point to the Chiefs' dominance was added by Otis Taylor. What we did was, I went on a quick count, and we just happened to get lucky. They had an all-out blitz coming, which they generally didn't. They blitzed very seldom. I hit Otis Taylor with a little hitch pass. That was the only pass I could have gotten rid of. The score clinched Kansas City's victory in Super Bowl IV and turned Len Dawson's nightmare of gambling rumors into a lifelong dream come true. I thought it entirely fitting that he got the uh, Super Bowl MVP. When Lenny went through the year that he went through and the triumph that he had, it's one of the great stories in professional sports. Go ahead, go ahead for Mike, Len Lenny Dawson. That's the way to go, Leonard. You've done good, kid. Lenny Dawson leaves the field. Lenny Dawson, listen to the crowd. Nice going, Leonard. Nice going, baby. Nice going, baby. And Lenny the Cool is Lenny the Cool, but he works at it. There's a lot of demons that he faces that we all do. He's just a lot better at masking them. I know, like a big old weight had been lifted off my shoulders. You know, you got to remember, I am the seventh son of a seventh son. To me, that's always been good luck, and is never more true than that particular season, that particular game. So all of us recognize that a season is almost like a lifetime of things that can happen. So to have your son there to be a part of your success, to realize that those things that were talked about from an integrity standpoint were not true and not real, you share it with the person who's truly most important to you, and that's your family. Well, amongst all everybody in the locker room wasn't that big, and there were people all over the place yelling and screaming. And somebody said, uh, "Come on in here. You got to call from the president." I said, "President of what?" <laughs> they said, "President of the United States." I said, "You're kidding me." And it was President Nixon. <laughs> he uh, congratulated me on the victory over the Minnesota Vikings, and he said something else too that was very interesting. He said, "That stuff in Detroit." He says, "There's nothing to that." I said, well, if the President of the United States says that, uh, that's a relief, yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'd never been contacted by anybody. To my knowledge, none of the other people whose names were mentioned were ever contacted by anybody. The whole thing vanished after about a week. After that week, what would you hear about it? Nothing. You know, we're coming back to Kansas City. They say it's going to be a parade. Of course, there's never been a parade before because no one had ever won a championship in Kansas City before in any sport. I don't know of anybody that was working that day. I don't know anybody that was, I don't, uh, God forbid you had a heart attack or something. There's anybody going to take care of you. I want to introduce, I want to introduce the greatest quarterback in pro football, Lenny Dawson.
This NFL Films production has been brought to you by NFL Network. Watch the National Football League 24 hours a day on NFL Network.